Hi, everyone. I am Ming Jia from the Circulation COVID team. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Carolyn Lam from the National Heart Center in Singapore, where she serves as a senior consultant cardiologist. In addition, she is a professor at the Duke and U.S. Cardiovascular Academic Clinical Program, as well as associate editor for Circulation. Dr. Lam, thank you very much for being part of our initiative called Circulation COVID Updates from the Frontlines. Oh my goodness, thank you so much, Ming. It feels so strange to sit on the opposite end of the, the mic, so to speak, you know, um, having usually asked the questions in circulation on the run and now with a video as well. The goal of this discussion is to uh, get your perspective on how your institution and really Singapore as a whole has led uh, initiatives to battle COVID-19. So let's start with a very pressing issue, which is flattening the curve. Now there's been a big difference in cumulative cases and fatalities of COVID-19 between Singapore and actually many of the Asian countries when compared to many Western nations. So we see these trajectories in Singapore that have shown a gradual rise, whereas curves for countries like Italy, Spain, and now for the United States have continued at a much steeper increase. So Dr. Lam, what do you think are the biggest contributors to this difference and what can we learn from Singapore's experience that can better prepare us going forward? Yeah, thanks so much for this opportunity to be able to share. I, I really am sitting here, I'm, I'm, I'm here in my office actually, um, um, as a very proud Singaporean. Um, what, what happened to make us able to flatten the curve? Well, remember that places like Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, were also places that were hit by the SARS outbreak in 2003. And that is that was just such a, a, a traumatic experience for all of us. I personally had colleagues who died um, during that outbreak. And uh, I think that experience has really shaped the fact that we were more prepared and frankly, that we took the outbreak very seriously right from the start. Um, so Singapore, for example, had the first case uh, late January we were one of the first countries to actually stop um, flights coming from Wuhan to Singapore. And at that time, I remember people thought that we were very draconian. Uh, but, you know, if you've been through SARS, I mean, immediately there were many, many things that were enacted because we recognized uh, what happened and we definitely didn't want the same thing to happen again. So I think one of the things is taking it seriously and acting fast. And, and it, that came from a bad experience. I would hate that it would take this to make other people take it seriously quickly and, and, and uh, um, in future, but that's, that's the truth. Secondly, is this tremendous ability to track cases, again, from our learning in SARS. But here I want to share a very personal experience. So, Remember, the first cases came in late January in Singapore. So imagine me in my home in just early February, and I receive a call, or rather my husband receives a call from our Ministry of Health in Singapore, saying that they've been identified, both him and my son, have been identified as contacts of a positive coronavirus case at that time. And how the ministry was able to locate us, they happened to sit in a taxi of a positive driver wow. just for a 10 minute cab ride. And this is what I, I call good contact tracing. So that gentleman happened to get a positive test on a Sunday and immediately my, my husband and son were called to say they had to undergo home quarantine for two weeks. And the next thing we knew, we actually had someone from the Ministry of Health coming to our doorstep with a package that included masks, thermometers, um, strict instructions on what they were supposed to do. So they had to segregate themselves from the, from the rest of us in, in the household and take their temperatures twice daily. And, and watch this they actually received calls from the Ministry of Health during those 14 days, every morning 
and every evening with video so that the Ministry wow. of Health could look at my husband and, and kid to see that they looked well and that they were at home, that they did not break um, um, the home quarantine. So imagine that kind of level of contact tracing happening all over my country. That's how, when it was going up, we were able to flatten it because we literally hunted down every single contact and we could actually build stories and, and in the whole country, we actually knew exactly how each person got it. We, we ended up publicizing that there were clusters. One of the clusters happened, for example, in one of the workplaces. Another cluster was from a meeting that happened in one of the hotels. Another was unfortunately from large gatherings, either religious and so on. But we knew, we all knew exactly. So it was completely mapped out. So with that kind of control, it was very well managed because people were immediately quarantined. The other thing that I really salute um, uh, our government for is for adopting a spirit of transparency right from the start. So the idea was Singapore soon became known as a hotbed. I mean, I had people worried about us in Singapore at that time, you know, um, and that's because we tested and we published and, and it was, Tremendous to see that our minister uh, um, said, this is what we've chosen to do. We've chosen a spirit of transparency. We want to react with objectivity. Um, you know, if, if you don't test, there won't be cases, right? But you test, it looks bad, but frankly, that's the way you gain control um, um, over it all. So that's really the way we, we managed it. Um, uh, uh, if, if I could say the, the other thing other than being taking it seriously and acting fast, really, really good contact tracing. The third thing is preparedness. So somehow by serendipity, we had a 330 bed facility, brand new, called the National Center for Infectious Disease, NCID, fully built and ready, somehow opened by September 2019 and was there ready for such a, for such a pandemic. And, and who knew that months later, um, it's exactly how we contained all the cases, the double screening, because there was an entire building just ready, just for that. That's preparedness. And we had all the masks that we need, the gowns that we needed, we were prepared. Um, so that, that's really, I think the message is. The good news is, um, that there is a way that we can get out of it. Uh, we've seen it, uh, although now we're experiencing a second wave um, of cases that unfortunately came in from Europe um, and the US. Um, I, we, I, I strongly believe that, that together we can really uh, get, get control of it. Oh, that's very impressive. So I wanna go back, Dr. Lamb, to what you mentioned before in terms of contact tracing. So how were the you know, people in the Ministry of Health able to exactly pinpoint who was actually coming in contact with these COVID patients? Very good question. And that's because in, in Singapore, the, the transport companies did allow the government to look at this. And that does mean, though, a larger message is that we do have to give up a little bit of these privacy controls for the greater good. Um, no, but I like not for once that me or my family go, how did you get my number? How did you know I was in that cab? You know, we were like, thank goodness, you know, and, and it's similarly, we have a society that embraces that. Um, I've got on my phone now an app that traces everyone that, that says you have to give a bit of privacy, uh, but it's really for the greater good. Hell, I, I uploaded it um, on my phone and many of my fellow Singaporeans have. So, you know, I think we need to realize that, that a lot of behavior um, has to change for the societal good. So these, you know, technological innovations where they already developed, these infrastructures were set in place already, or are some of these strategies, you know, kind of developed on the fly as, you know, the situation evolves? So a lot of it is on the fly. Um, this tracing app, for example, just came about uh, last week. 
um, we've, we've only recently started, you know, really formalizing telemedical uh, encounters uh, with our patients. In fact, just today, literally, I received an email from my Ministry of Health kind of going, um, we're, we're going to have a webinar now on, on what, what we should and shouldn't do in this age of telemedicine because we think it's here to stay. I mean, you know, so, so we're, we're sort of keeping up with it. Um, things that, that telecommunication, uh, WebEx, Zoom, what we're doing right now, oh my goodness, it's changed the world. So, um, for example, one of the best things I think uh, that, that happened in Singapore is we had a medical meeting where many of our physicians uh, tuned in by Zoom, and it was organized by the Academy of Medicine, and it basically had our infectious disease specialists really just sharing good scientific, up-to-date knowledge of our own data. So no I hate to say this, no, it's not political, there was no agenda, there was a, it was just pure medical scientific sharing. And, and that's the way it should be. Absolutely, totally agree with you, Dr. Lam. So I'm glad that you mentioned telemedicine. So what do you think about telemedicine? Has it worked well in terms of supplementing kind of routine clinic visits for cardiologists? Or, you know, temporarily, can it replace routine clinic visits in some cases, especially with emergencies? Yeah, I hear you see a, a great tension for me. I am truly one of those people that I love the human touch. I love to hold the patient's hands. I enjoy that time with the patient. And, I, and I, I'm a feely type of a person. But I really have to admit, telemedicine is, is not just helpful. It's here to stay. I have a feeling that the stuff that we do now, it is going to be a paradigm shift for us in, in medicine because I'm realizing now that a lot of visits are, are honestly, they're well visits. They're for medication top-ups and, you know, um, talking to the patient, um, seeing them on video is effective. Now, I, I think at the end of the day, we need a bit of balance, but um, I, I do believe that the advantages of telemedicine are really going to be felt now, and it should permanently change the way we practice. Never complete replacement, but to help. Thank you so much for those great insights. Now, I want to uh, pivot on a topic I think that's going to be of great interest to many of the uh, circulation readers and viewers. And uh, that is your experience as a, a clinical trialist and as a clinician scientist in the time of COVID-19. So uh, uh, how, how has yeah. the uh, pandemic impacted the clinical trials in cardiology that you're a part of? Oh my goodness, it, it has hugely impacted clinical trials. And this is one of those things that I have to admit, I kind of stumbled upon. Because the first thing that happens when, when a epidemic and outbreak uh, uh, occurs is, of course, clinical care and frontline work. Absolutely. And of course, the first thing that happens is this attitude that we must do no harm and we must reduce risk to everybody, which means also research staff get deployed to clinical scenarios and um, research is deprioritized. Right. So, so first, I want to tell everybody I recognize that, and, and, I, and of course, that's something that we do. But as time goes by, we also have to recognize that we do owe our patients within clinical trials a huge responsibility. I mean, they have sacrificed um, their time, their blood, their, their, their lives, um, um, in many cases, to join a clinical trial. So for those enrolled in a clinical trial, I really think that's, that's a priority. If they're on life-saving medications, we need to ensure that we still get it to them. If there's potential to um, survey for life-threatening adverse events, we should still continue to by hook or by crook, you know. Um, if, uh, for example, to make their time that they've donated uh, kindly to the trial worthwhile, we still should continue to try to survey for outcomes to make it meaningful, right, and, and, and not just a wash. So I think there, there then becomes a graduated um, attention to what we must prioritize first, and I've already named, named a few patient safety, um, life-saving trials, staff safety, 
So one of the things we've instituted in my department, for example, is um, we separate into two teams of patient-facing research staff and non-patient-facing administrative staff. And we try to, to make sure there's a segregation just in case a contact occurs and we can quarantine one or the other. The other thing, all visits are preceded with a phone call that, that screens strictly for travel history, for symptoms and so on. We do a, a very detailed log so that in case we need to contact trace, as, as I've already told you, it's, it's huge in Singapore, that, that that's all done uh, very well. Now, a lot of things are changed to virtual contact, if at all possible, rather than physical. Um, this, again, is like that conversation we just had on telemedicine, is one of the things that I think is going to change the way we look at trials on a permanent basis, and rightly so, because there are many things that we could do virtually, and perhaps we should be designing trials in future, considering that better. Nowadays, we have apps that can, um, you know, for example, obtain outcomes like uh, patient-reported outcomes. Even six-minute walk, you know, the patient okay. that can do the six-minute <laughs> yeah. walk, you know. I mean, of course, there are procedures that come into place. It, 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 it doesn't mean, you know, what we'll be doing, designing trials that needed these inpatient visits. No, it doesn't, it doesn't negate all of that. I'm just saying, you know, it's kind of opening a new world to consider this. And then investigator meetings, you know, uh, when does it need to actually be in person? I think that's almost the easiest one. We've turned it all virtual. And then, of course, that, that, that makes us question, oh, so why did we need that huge carbon footprint to fly everybody from everywhere uh, to do these investigator meetings? And, you know, that's going to be a question of balance. Uh, as, I, as I said with patient contact, I, I also enjoy contact with people, you know, and, and, I, and I do think a lot of robust discussions actually occur at the water cooler, so to speak, you know, while we're stepping up for the coffee break is when we, we actually get the best ideas. So, so hopefully we end up in a good balance in future. But um, I, I, I really think going back to the clinical trials question, there are many aspects to it from patients to staff to investigators, um, all of which we have to consider very carefully. Um, on the one hand is trials that haven't been started that obviously we should really, really think about whether or not to delay the start. At the other extreme, you have, may have trials that are really just so close to, to closure, and maybe that requires data monitoring committees and so on to assess to see, you know, should we try to, to are there enough events, should we try to close uh, first? And then in the middle are all those that have patients that we need to be responsible to and responsible for, and that, that covers uh, the things that I, I talked about earlier, about ensuring that they continue to receive life-saving medications, are, are surveyed, and um, have follow-up. Now, one, one question I want to ask, just out of my own curiosity then, is you know, the, if a patient on trial does have a COVID infection, does that, that introduce like a confounding for example, how are you going to address that during the uh, trial? That's a really good question. And in fact, this is something that I just had discussion with with some really smart people, uh, you know, trialists from all over the world, because we're now wondering, do we need to adjudicate COVID-19 infections? Do we need to sort of suggest, highly recommend, mandate even COVID-19 testing in 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 outcomes, I'm in the heart failure world, right? Because when someone comes in breathless, first, it could be COVID. Secondly, COVID could precipitate the heart failure um, hospitalization. And, you know, is, is it going to cause imbalance? And now that patients don't want to come to hospital, what do we call heart failure that's treated outside? Do we, do we need to change our endpoint, um, um, you know, definitions and so on? So these are all discussions that, are, that have just come up. So, so it's a very good question, Ming. I wish I had the answer, but um, in general, at least it's something that we know we need to consider, and hopefully we can get together and, and have agreement on what we should do with those in the future. Well, we look forward to that, Dr. Lam. So before we wrap up here, any uh, parting thoughts that you have for our audience? I do, and I hope this is not too philosophical at a moment like, like this, but um, 
I, I've just found myself um, wondering in amazement at, at how this has personally impacted me. Um, I've never been so grounded I mean, like right now, I'm supposed to be in Chicago at the ACC, right? Um, and and just paradoxically, while being quarantined, how I feel like my space and time have enlarged. I mean, we're we're doing so many things uh, virtually. I I have time, and I'm just thinking this is a really really good time for us to reflect on how small yet big our world is. How equal we all are. This, this virus is impacting us everywhere. Whether you're, no matter your status, no matter what you know or don't know, um, and um, how it's really a good time to be grateful for health and family. Um, I, I, I really, that, that's truly the take home for me. Absolutely, I cannot agree more.